Good morning. I would just like to quickly introduce to you um, Chandler Dale. Um, he's going to be speaking and preaching to you today. He is from the Indiana Southeast Campus, and he is their youth pastor, and he is going into the ministry. And at this time, I'd just like to say a prayer over Ch uh, Chandler at this time. Chandler, we just ask that you, you have peace and understanding, and you just bring the word today, Lord. And we just ask that you use your voice to speak wor God's word and allow us to receive it and then allow God to fill you back up. We ask that he give you a special blessing over your, your life in ministry, Lord. We ask that, that he be with you and guide you and direct you and all that you do and say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here this morning. And uh, before I introduce myself a little further and before I uh, get to uh, the message, I just want to say I, I got lost on the way here this morning. And I'm, and I'm so thankful I did because I passed this beautiful old white church with beautiful stained glass, and it was run down. There was, there was gonna, there's going to be no services there this morning, and I'm just reminded uh, of your all's faithfulness, and, and I was encouraged by it because in the 21st century, people don't go to a church that doesn't have a preacher unless you understand that the church isn't a building a church isn't a preacher or a great worship band, but a church is the body of Christ. And so I want to give you guys a round of applause this morning. So I'm, I'm thankful I got lost this morning because I, I learned a lesson. Uh, whenever I speak at, whether it be an FCA event or, a, or some school or a, a church, I always introduce myself by, by sharing three things about me. I was a, the first thing is that I was a former Red Devil. So I went to, that's right. So I went to Jeffersonville High School, and I'm a very proud Jeffersonville alumni. I played uh, baseball and basketball there and uh, got to uh, uh, experience a lot there, a lot of good things, a lot of bad things, and many of the things that I experienced are, have shaped who I am today. And so I love, I love the fact that I'm from Jeff. And then the second thing is I'm a former Louisville Cardinal. And so I got to, that's, that'll preach, amen. Uh, I'm a former Louisville Cardinal. I got to play on the baseball team for three years at, at UofL, and I'm so, so grateful for those memories, uh, some of the sweetest moments of my life, some of the most difficult moments of my life, and uh, I, there is no, no question that if I didn't experience the, the uh, moments away from God there that I, I wouldn't be up here today. And so, and the last one is this, and this is where everyone kind of looks at me strangely. Uh, so I was a former Red Devil, a former cardinal, and I was also a formal, former lost sheep. <laughs> That's where people don't understand, the usual crowds don't understand that, but Luke 15 uh, resonates with me because it's the story of the good shepherd, and uh, he left the 99 to find the one, and, and I was the one, and I'm sure some of you can relate with that, but what I, don't, what I didn't understand when I was lost is it, I looked like a pretty good Christian, and then I found Jesus, and, and my life has been transformed. And I love what it says in Luke 15. It says that the good shepherd went to find the one, and he put him on his shoulders with joy, and he took him home. And I'm home now, and I'm excited uh, to be here speaking with you guys. I'm excited to be here speaking with you guys about what God has put on my heart. And, and the message title, I don't know if it's up there. It will be in a second. It is... I want to talk about our good Samaritan, our good Samaritan. And the question I want to ask you this morning and that I want you to be on your mind for the entire time I'm speaking is, do you ever wonder about eternal life? Think about that briefly and then for the rest of the message, do you ever wonder about eternal life? Uh, has anyone seen the show This Is Us? It's a great show. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. But there's a, there's a scene in the first season of This Is Us, and it's this woman who has these three kids. And he, she goes back years later, as, once the kids are grown up, she goes back to the hospital, and she sees the doctor that helped birth her three ch children. And it's a cool moment, and she's, the doctor's about to die. Spoiler alert. The doctor's about to die, and she asks him. They have this long conversation, and then she asks them, 
asks this, the man about to die. He says, are you scared? And then the man looks at her and, and he says, scared? Of the great beyond? I don't think so. I guess I would just be curious. And that's a true for a lot of us here, and that's not new. That's not new, but uh, there's countless theories, theologies, ideas, beliefs, etc., about the afterlife, about what happens once we die. And, and just to name a few, futurism, the rapture, the new heaven, the new earth, the tribulation, etc., etc. There are countless theories of what happens to get to eternity. And it's, I don't know if you're like me, but for me, that's a little bit intimidating. And I think so, that's okay. It's, it's, I guess it's human nature for us to be uh, curious or, or desire, I guess, desire security and salvation and safety. And it, it's definitely uh, on our minds occasionally. Like, what would happen if I were to die tonight? A curi- eternity is a curious subject, and that's not new. That's, it was the same thing in Jesus' time, and, and even more so. In, in Jesus' time, the average lifespan was 30 to 35 years old, which is not very, not very old, because they didn't, they didn't really have a grasp on medicine, and so that life was even shorter back then. And so you can imagine, even in a, a far more religious time, that people were curious about what happened to get to eternal life, what would have to, have to happen. And so <laughs> it's funny that... that if you think about that being a common question now and then, you, it's even more so when you think about this man named Jesus walking on earth. He's here healing the lepers. He's walking on water. He's working miracles. He's doing whatever Jesus does. And so people are thinking, oh, this is a prophet of old. I bet he knows things about the future. And so Jesus probably got this question asked many times, but specifically in the passage we're going to be looking at today, if you have your Bibles, in Luke chapter 10, we're going to be looking at something uh, very interesting. It's when Jesus was asked about eternal life. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 10. That's where we're going to be for the entirety of the message this morning. And It's a story we've all heard. You, you could probably preach this sermon as well. It's a story we've all heard, but I hope you see something new this morning, like I have in the months uh, since I've really been uh, wrestling with this passage. And so Luke 10, 25, 37, I'm going to go ahead and read it for us. And I'm going to stop along the way just to explain further uh, some, some ideas. But we'll start in verse 25, the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So you got to understand that this is a man, in verse 25 it says he is an expert in the law. If you're an expert in the law in Jesus' time, you dressed like an expert in the law because you wanted everyone to know, hey, I'm above you. And so here's what, here's what this, this is funny to me. He knew the answer to the question he was asking. So he's either doing one of two things. He's either testing Jesus' legitimacy, like, Jesus, are you actually who you are? Or he's trying to pin Jesus up against himself to answer the wrong question so that they can crucify him, which, spoiler alert, that ends up happening. Uh, but So this man knew the answer to the question that he was asking. And so we'll, keep, we'll continue on. Verse 26, Jesus says, What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? Good luck trick, tricking Jesus. Like I said, this man looked like a teacher of the law. Jesus knew that he knew. Okay, So we'll continue on. Verse 27. The man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And, Jesus, or the man says, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. We're going to come back to this verse later on in the message. But verse 29 The man says, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I can just picture Jesus being finished with the conversation, turning around, and then the man asked, who is my neighbor? And Jesus may have wanted him to ask this, but and he does. And so here's here's what Jesus says. He's about ready to drop a truth bomb right here. So we're going to continue on, and this is who our neighbor is. This is who the man's neighbor is. Verse Verse 30 through 37, here we go. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. 
They stripped him of, of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Verse 36, Jesus says, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Verse 37, the expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. I love what the UKV version says about go and do likewise. It says, Then change who you view as your neighbor and love everyone. Don't restrict your love like the priest or Levi to only those whom you deem worthy and righteous, but love like the good Samaritan whose heart reflects the loving behavior of someone who has inherited the gift of eternal life. That's a big story, and, and there's a lot to, to chew on right there, but this man asked about eternal life. Let's not skip that. This man asked about eternal life, and Jesus answered. So what does that mean for us? Did Jesus just give us an equation to attain eternal life, or is he deeper than that? Yes. He did. He did just give us an equation, but he's also deeper than that. And so if you want to view Luke 10, 27, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, if you want to view it as an equation, I believe you will begin a beautiful journey towards living in the grace of Jesus. But I hate math, so I'm not going to view it as an equation. But here's another, if you want to view Luke 10, 27 as a poem or as a beautiful, deep, life-filled words, you will begin a beautiful journey towards the grace of Jesus. Of Jesus. It's a simple gospel. John 3 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his one and only son that whoever wants to believe in him will not perish but will have eternal life. It is a simple gospel. I had a, I had a teammate one time ask what John 3 16 said and I told him and he said, is that it? Is that simple? I said, yeah, <laughs> it is. It's that simple. If you just believe, that's all you got to do. But hear me out. If your belief isn't transforming you to love him with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and if your neighbors aren't experiencing your love, then you may be believing in God like UK thought they were going to beat U of L in football. <laughs> Don't be foolish. This gospel is simple, yes, but it transforms. And it is a deep, deep well. And here's the difference. Are we believing with our mouth, with our tongue, or are we believing with our life outside of the church doors? And this might make sense to some of you. It, in a marriage, like you can say I love you, and some of you have probably experienced this, you can say I love you but not feel the love. That's just like our relationship with Jesus. We can say, I believe in you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus, and not be experiencing the love. And so I want to ask two questions on this passage, passage to see where we are with God. And the first one is this. How is your love life? How is your love life with God? And I want to ask some further questions, and I love what the message version says about the, the words it uses in Luke 10, 27 is this. It says, love with all your passion, prayer, muscle, and intelligence. And I want to use those four words, passion, prayer, muscle, and intelligence, to ask us some questions to see where our love life with God is. The first is passion. Is God a part of your passions? Do you love the things that God loves? Do you voice your opinions because you care deeply for the people it affects or 
You just want to win an argument. So that's passions. Is God a part of your passion? Prayer. What captivates your mind? Social media or the creator of communication? Do you pray only before meals or do you pray during the entire day in constant communication with the Father? If God answered all your prayers, would the world look different or just you? Do you ever sit and listen for the quiet whispers of the Holy Spirit or do you continue to rush through the day? The last one for prayer. Do you pray when you need God or do you pray because you want God? That one's tough for me to hear. And the next one, muscle. So passion, prayer, muscle. Are your actions for God's glory or your own glory? When you feel weak, do you try harder or do you trust harder? I'm a trier. Intelligence. Do you surrender and renew your mind to the Creator every day and every moment? Or another one, do you shout wisdom or do you share wisdom? Those are tough questions for me to answer because I start to realize, man, maybe my love life with God isn't as good as I think it is. And that's okay. Our humanity and our sin and living in this world makes it hard to love God all the time with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and all of our strength. It makes it difficult. Is it possible with the Spirit? Absolutely. But is it difficult? Absolutely. But thanks be to God that God put on flesh and moved into the neighborhood and became our neighbor. Because of the grace poured out on the cross, we don't have to have a perfect love life with God. But we must strive to begin every day with our heart, soul, mind, and strength open to whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do with us. And yes, we will have our moments of failure, but thankfully I never have I ever read anything in John 3.16 about requiring perfection. It doesn't exist. This is something that I've been doing in the, in the past couple of months that has really transformed my walk with Jesus. And, and it just lasts about 15 seconds when I wake up. I do these, these things, and it, and it sets my day up to experience whatever he wants me to experience. Here's what I say. Good morning, Lord. What's on your heart today, God? And Holy Spirit, how's our friendship? I ask those things, and that's all I do in the morning. I don't pray for 10, 15 minutes. Probably should. I just spend a couple seconds inviting God into my day. And guess what? When you invite God, I promise you, he will meet you there. When we are obedient, he meets us in his faithfulness every single time. Every single time. So I I challenge you to start your day seeking him and because he just wants you. He wants your heart. He wants a relationship with you. So think about that question, not just right now, but for, for the rest of your day. How is your love life with God? And how can you change your love life with God? And the second question about this passage, passage is, and it's the toughest one for me. I'm going to read it, verse 30 through 37 again, and then I'm going to ask the question. And so we'll start in verse 30. Here's the Good Samaritan story. Verse, verse 29, actually, I'll start there. And who is my neighbor? Verse 30, in reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem, to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. The robbers stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. 
Verse 36, Jesus asks, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, Go and do likewise. So the second question I want us to ask ourselves, Do you pass by your neighbors every day, or do you love them like Jesus calls us to love them? Jesus says, it's simple, love your neighbor as yourself. And if you're like me, I love myself a lot. (laughs) Whenever I want something, I usually go get it for myself. If something's convenient for me, I usually make time for myself. If I want to pamper myself, I usually do it. And I'm always ready to serve myself. Is your coworker loved by you the same way that you love yourself? Your brother, your sister loved by you the same way that you love yourself, your coach, teammate, your parent, teacher, the waiters and waitresses that that get you water every time? Is everyone in your life loved by you the way that you love you? Because it's clear that Jesus doesn't want us just, just to say, hey, I love you, Mom, or hey, thanks, brother. Jesus is very, very clear on what this love is supposed to look like because this, listen, this Samaritan was not supposed to help this Jew. In fact, he wasn't even allowed to. This wasn't allowed in this culture. Martin Luther King, when he was still alive, preached a sermon on this message, and he said it was very similar to a black man loving a white man. Not only was it full of tension, but white man didn't want the black man's love. That's what this is like in that culture. Jesus was making a point, love even those who hate you. And you might be thinking, but Chandler, you don't understand. My my parent, he's like he's like the robber in the story. He my parents always finding a way to steal my joy. Or, but Chandler, you don't know my coworker. She's like She's like the, uh, the priest in this story, too good for anyone. She just walks by and, and people, think, people think she's better than, than anyone else. But Chandler, my classmates, they're like the Levite. And Levites were like, like the apprentices of the priest, so like a leech, like, like a shadow. Like they just followed the shadow. And they craved to be like someone else. Chandler, I can't love my classmates. You don't understand. And whatever our excuses are, yes, yeah. We're called to love them too. To show them the amazing love the Good Samaritan showed. And, and I, want you, I want us to go through everything the Good Samaritan did. The Good Samaritan bandaged the man's wounds. That's a healing love. The Good Samaritan poured oil and wine on his wounds. That's an extravagant love. The Good Samaritan put the man on his own donkey, that's a sacrificial love. He took him to a hotel room, that's a costly love. The Good Samaritan returns for him, that's an unending love. So the, Jesus said this, love the Lord your God with everything, with your heart, soul, strength, mind, and in this, love your neighbor like you love yourself. And Love your neighbor like the Good Samaritan loved this man. It's difficult, yes. But is it possible with God? Yes. Jesus paints a beautiful picture in this parable. Love God and love people. It's that simple. So I want to ask you the question we started with. Do you ever wonder about eternal life? I do. You probably do as well. And so did the expert in the law. But I want, you to, I want you to take a close look at what Jesus said. The man asked this. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' response, and which, what we're going to go to right now, like I said earlier, in verse 28, he didn't really answer the question. The man asked, what do, you, what do I get to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. 
If I'm the man, I'm thinking to myself, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. I asked about eternal life, not about life now. I don't want to know how to live. I'm doing that well. I'm a religious leader. How do I get eternal life? I think Jesus, he wants us to change the way we think, and it starts in this verse. Do this and you will live. Not, he didn't say do this and you will get eternal life. He said do this and you will live. What if Jesus is on to something here? What if he's teaching us something that maybe we've never heard before? What if eternal life wasn't about life after death? What if eternal life was about life before death? Right now. And yes, I get it. If you trust, I believe fully, if you trust God with your life, your name will be written in the book of life, just like Revelation says. And yes, John 3.16 is truth. If you believe in him, you will never perish. You will have eternal life. But I want you to check me, check, fact check me later. Jesus didn't say John 3.16. Those words aren't read in your Bible. Jesus said John 17.3 which is the verse we're going to talk about in a second, but this verse has changed my life and I will never live the same because of these words that Jesus said, these words that are in red letters. And I want to talk to you about my defining moment that will never leave me the same. I was in Israel in January. And specifically, at this point, we were at the Garden of Gethsemane. And we, we had a little devotion there, and a friend of mine, Chad, said his devotion was this. He said, life is the summation of what you do with a moment. And God gave me a moment in the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and this is what I'm doing with it. So what do you do in the Garden of Gethsemane? How do you have quiet time where Jesus was arrested right before he was crucified? What do you do? Like, so I'm thinking to myself that, that same thing, and, and I turn to John 17, which is what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a lengthy chapter. John 17 is very long. I encourage you to read it on your own. But So I'm starting to read John 17 because that makes sense when you're in the Garden of Gethsemane. But I stopped at, at verse 3. I couldn't read beyond verse 3. Here's what John 17, 3 says. Now, now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I read that and I stopped. And I, I questioned God. I asked God, I said, God, what do you mean eternal life is knowing you? It's not heaven? It's right now? This is the only time in my life that I feel like God spoke to me, and he said two words. He said, yes, now. And John 17, 3 is why I love this parable so, so much, because the more I read this story of the Good Samaritan, the more I see myself in the story. You, got, you have to understand the parables. Parables didn't happen. Parables were made-up stories of Jesus' creativity, that shared practical wisdom. So when I hear that fact, I see myself in this story, and I see that this isn't just a story that happened. This is a story that happens. Because I've seen myself half dead spiritually on the side of the road. Days pass by, reaching, reaching out for something to save me. Religion couldn't do it. Sports couldn't do it. Alcohol couldn't do it. Girls couldn't do it. Nothing gave me life. Nothing rescued me. And I remained on the side of the road, dead spiritually. And I think some of you can relate. Some of you are on the side of the road, beaten up by the world, half dead, waiting for your good Samaritan to come and rescue, waiting for status to come and pick you up and say, hey, I got you waiting for wealth to come and say, hey, I'll rescue you. Waiting for security, for, for a relationship, for a job, for fame, 
they won't rescue you. Those won't rescue you. But someone will. And someone wants to rescue you. I love this story so much because this isn't a story that happened. This is a story that happens. We have a good Samaritan. Jesus came. He put on flesh and he walked on this earth. Why? Because he has a healing love for you. He has an extravagant love for you. He has a sacrificial love for you. It's a costly love. It cost him his life. And he promises that he will return again for you. I hope you see it now. This story isn't about a Jew and a Samaritan. This story is about us and Jesus. Jesus is our good Samaritan. All of those aspects of love that the good Samaritan did, he did for us as well. He's done it for me, and he desires deeply to do it for you. He wants wants for you to receive his love for today, tomorrow, tomorrow. And for all of eternity. So the question is no longer, do you ever wonder about eternal life? The question is now, do you want eternal life? Right now and forever and ever and ever. I'll read John 17, 3 again. It says this, and I love that the first word is what it is. Now, this is eternal life. that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Church, I promise you, test me on this. Every day, if you wake up desiring to love the Lord with everything that you have, and if you desire to love your neighbor as yourself, that I promise you, you will experience eternal life right now. Some of you are feeling the healing, powerful love of Jesus right now, and and you recognize you're half dead on the side of the road. It's not an emotion that you're experiencing. It's not a religion that you're experiencing. This is a holy moment for you. And I believe Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. I believe that. That's what he does. And I believe that Jesus wants to set you free, and he wants to rescue you off the side of the road, and he longs for you to have a full life of experiencing him right now as a daughter or as a son of God. Please don't leave here without having a conversation about what that looks like. We're about to have another time of worship and and another time, also a time of invitation. And if you want to have a conversation or if you need prayer over anything, there's going to be people down front and we challenge you to, and I encourage you to come up, come forward and have that conversation because eternal life starts right now. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to worship. God, thank you so much for having a healing love, an extravagant love, a sacrificial love, a costly love, and a, and a love that returns for us. God, we believe we will be with you one day. But also, God, I believe we can be with you right now. I thank you for waking us up this morning. You obviously still have a purpose for us on this earth. So thank you, God, that we got to hear the story of you, our good Samaritan. God, would you put it on our hearts to respond in whatever way you want us to. God, thank you, God, that we... We can walk with you. Love being your son. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen.
so thankful for you today, dear God, for the message that Chandler brought. Dear God, I pray that we are a church that knows that we need you now. Dear God, I just thank you for that message. I hope that it resonates in our hearts and our minds this week. And dear God, that we are forever changed because of the message we heard. I pray that we wake up, dear God, inviting you into our life, inviting you in now. Not later, but now, dear God. I pray that we go about our week, dear Lord, whether we're at school or if we're at work or if we're at home or we're going to the grocery store, dear God, that we are a Christian, dear God, that claims your name now, dear Lord. I just thank you and I just praise you and ask for safety for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank 
Thank you for the gift of your son Thank you for the glorious one He came to die for us Because he loved us the most Thank you for the gift of your son You're amazing, Lord So amazing, Lord You gave the gift That we could not afford Lord Have a great week, everyone.